Thank you to Danny Maloney, Moose, Pans Away, Pav2, Pushy Chouquette, Zachary Crumroy, and Zed Liu for financially supporting this channel, allowing me to buy food to live. Today we're going to look at the political context and fallout to the 1667 to 1668 War of Devolution, when the French monarchy invaded the Spanish Netherlands and the Franche Comte region. We'll start by looking at the position of Western European politics from the end of the Thirty Years' War in 1648, and give a pretty broad overview of the general political situation in the build-up to the War of Devolution in 1667, as well as the political developments which came to pass during the war and in its immediate aftermath in 1668. Militarily, the war honestly isn't much to talk about. There were some sieges, but no major battles. However, I think the politics of the War of Devolution are really interesting, in that we see enemies uniting, allies turning on one another, ulterior motives pretty much everywhere, and the stage set for decades of future conflict. For religious and political reasons I will not be explaining, the Thirty Years' War began in 1618. As far as the French monarchy was concerned, the war provided an opportunity to positively alter their strategic situation in Europe. At the time, the global superpower was the Spanish monarchy, which not only controlled and wielded massive influence in Europe, but also in its overseas empire, especially in Central and South America. The Spanish monarchy and the Holy Roman Imperial, slash Austrian monarchy, were run by the same family, the Habsburgs. At least with regards to Western European kingdoms like France, as I can't necessarily speak for other places, we have to remember that the political justification for the ruling class was that God had specifically chosen them to rule. The monarchy or the ruling family and the country were essentially indivisible, meaning that foreign policy was constructed to serve the interests of a ruling class, and more specifically the ruling individual, of a dynastical possession upheld by religious arguments. The Habsburg dynasty then did what was best for the Habsburg dynasty. Because of this, the Spanish and Holy Roman Imperial slash Austrian monarchies' foreign policy was often very linked, because it was to serve the interests of the same family. The French monarchy under the Bourbon family was an opponent of the Habsburg family, whose power and territory effectively surrounded them on all sides. At this time, France was a frequently politically unstable country, which saw numerous civil wars and rebellions often linked to the religious conflict between Catholics and Protestants. Because of this internal instability and weakness, the French monarchy couldn't necessarily involve itself in the Thirty Years' War for quite some time, in the 1620s being preoccupied with the Huguenot rebellions, despite the chance to break Habsburg encirclement and increase their own power. However, they could rely on supporting others to undermine Habsburg power on their behalf. The French monarchy funded the Swedish monarchy, who invaded the Holy Roman Empire in 1630. The French monarchy would also ally with the government of the United Provinces, which, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to refer to as the Dutch government, who had been fighting the Spanish monarchy for decades as part of the Eighty Years' War. After supporting the Dutch government monetarily for years, in 1635, the French monarchy, now feeling in a stronger position, invaded the Spanish Netherlands in support of their Dutch government allies, beginning the Franco-Spanish War. The war lasted from 1635 to 1659 outlasting both the Eighty Years' War and the Thirty Years' War, which ended in 1648. During the war, another civil war against the monarchy known as the Sling broke out in France, in large part, according to one historian I read, as a reaction to the growing centralised power of the monarchy at the expense of traditional institutions, and the amount of money it demanded in taxes to pay for the war. The Spanish monarchy aided the rebels in the fighting, but they were defeated in 1653. Also during the war, the French monarchy aided the Catalan rebellion against the Spanish monarchy, known as the Reapers' War. By the end of the 1650s, both the Spanish and French monarchies were militarily weakened, bankrupt, and the war had stalemated. The French king at this time was Louis XIV, who'd actually come to power in 1643, but because he was only four years old, real power lay with a man called Cardinal Mazarin. Mazarin felt that Louis Bourbon's interests were best served by creating a system of alliances to counter Habsburg power. His predecessor, Cardinal Richelieu, had previously been instrumental in allying with the Swedish monarchy and the Dutch government, but since the end of the Thirty Years' War, the Dutch government was no longer available to undermine the Spanish monarchy. The English government, on the other hand, was. <laughs> 
The English monarchy had barely been involved in the Thirty Years' War, and from the late 1630s became embroiled in the Wars of the Free Kingdoms. In 1649, the king was executed and replaced by a republican government led by Oliver Cromwell. From 1652 to 1654, the English government went to war with the Dutch government, and from 1654 to 1660, with the Spanish monarchy. So, although they were opponents of the Dutch government, who were allies with the French monarchy, their equal opposition to the Spanish monarchy made them a useful partner for Bourbon interests in undermining Habsburg power. Mazarin made an alliance with Cromwell in 1657. In 1658, he made an alliance known as the League of the Rhine, with dozens of German princes, which provided those German princes with a counterbalance against Austrian monarchy power in the Holy Roman Empire, and provided the French monarchy with a belt of allies in a strategically important region. This not only helped to break the Habsburg strategic encirclement, but also cut off the Austrian Habsburg branch from militarily supporting the Spanish Habsburg branch in the Spanish Netherlands. In 1659, the French and Spanish monarchies ended their war with the Treaty of the Pyrenees. As part of the treaty, the Spanish monarch forced his daughter, Maria Theresa, to marry Louis XIV, now 21, who was her cousin. However, in exchange for the marriage, Maria Theresa gave up her claims to Habsburg territories. Instead of getting territory, she'd be given a large lump of gold coins instead. But, because the Spanish monarchy was so bankrupt, that money was never actually given which would provide a very useful excuse in a few years' time. One historian has argued that, all things considered, the post-war power balance in Western Europe had shifted from its pre-war position. Spain had declined to second-rate status, while France now stood as Christian Europe's preeminent land power. However, this isn't a 100% accepted analysis of the end of the war, as neither side necessarily won the war itself, and the Spanish monarchy retained its grip on the Spanish Netherlands, the Franche Comte, and its New World Empire. Many historians argue that rather than the Spanish monarchy losing the war, both sides just mutually agreed to end the stalemate. While agreeing that the Spanish monarchy remained a great, though very much weakened political power, I would personally side more with arguments that the French monarchy did win the war politically, if not decisively militarily. Mazarin had been the true power in the French monarchy ever since the death of his predecessor, Cardinal Richelieu, in the 1640s. Now, by 1660, he'd overseen the Bourbon family become one of the most powerful families in Western Europe, at the expense of the Spanish Habsburgs, and pretty much eliminated the Spanish monarchy as a viable threat to Bourbon interests for the foreseeable future. Plus, due to the long-standing alliance with the Dutch government and the recent formation of the League of the Rhine, he'd essentially broken the Habsburg family's encirclement and secured the French borders from any opponents. Then he died in 1661, and Louis, who took full control over the kingdom, set out on the path of unwittingly unravelling almost all of it. To Louis, peace was not necessarily a good thing. As one author argued, for Louis, the only legitimate object of peace could be the gift of time in which France would prepare for war. As I mentioned earlier, foreign policy served the interests of the individual monarch and his family, and that the monarch and the country were very openly seen as essentially indivisible. The monarch, after all, so the ideological arguments went, was appointed to their position in that state by God. The phrase, God and my right, still actually remains the motto of the British monarchy to this day. Louis XIV believed very strongly in this ideology, known as divine right, and because God had supposedly chosen the monarch to lead the country, the monarch's political interest was the state's political interest. As one historian relates Louis telling his son, kingly morality was grounded on reason of state, a judgment inspired and given, he wrote, only to kings over whom God alone is judge. In Bourbon's words, a king works for himself when he has the state in mind. The welfare of the one enhances the glory of the other, when the state is prosperous, exalted, and powerful, he who is the cause of it is rendered glorious by it, and no consideration should prevent him from doing so, not even for the sake of doing a kindness. A term wrongly ascribed to Louis, though it does actually reflect this worldview very well, is I am the state. Foreign policy, then, would be what served Bourbon's interests, and for him a large part of this was to prove himself as a monarch and a man, 
Then, as often now, the way to prove his masculinity to himself and his contemporaries was violence, and more specifically war. As one historian argued, his aim was, quite simply, to increase the grandeur of his state and of his house, so that his own preeminence as the greatest king in Christendom would be beyond dispute. As another put it, Louis XIV was intent on ensuring that French diplomatic hegemony ceased serving any abstract international order which may have emerged. Instead, with a great system of well-provisioned clerks, residents, heralds, ambassadors and spies, French statecraft was to become Louis's own instrument. A great narcissistic engine, fuelled and sated only by war. In Louis's court, despite the decades-long Franco-Spanish War having only just ended a few years previously, there was appetite for an end to the peace and a return to conflict. Marshal Turenne was a leading military official in the monarchy, and had played a large part in defeating the Spanish monarchy several times in the Spanish Netherlands near to the end of the Franco-Spanish War. According to one historian, Turenne believed that ending the war in 1659 had been a mistake, and that with just one more campaign, he could have captured the whole Spanish Netherlands for the Bourbon family. The historian relates that, throughout the early to mid-1660s, he repeatedly encouraged Louis to launch another war to take the region. Another figure in the court pushing for an aggressive, though not militaristic, foreign policy was the finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, but I'll get back to him in a minute. To return to the subject of the Spanish Netherlands, we should look more at internal Dutch government politics. While being a republic, the United Provinces was oftentimes run by a steward. In the 1660s, the holder of the stewardship became a potential vessel by which an English monarch could influence Dutch government affairs. In 1660, the Republican government of England was replaced by the monarchy of Charles II, son of the king the parliament had executed back in 1649. Charles's ten-year-old nephew was called William of Orange, and the Orangists were a major faction in the Dutch government. Another prominent faction, the Republicans, was led by a man called Johann de Witt, and had excluded William of Orange from taking the stewardship, and anyone else for that matter, since 1650. The Orangists hoped that Charles II being on the English throne would provide them with an ally who could use his influence to get another Orangist into power, and so the Republicans looked towards the French monarchy as their ally in this internal struggle. Louis XIV was very happy to ally with this faction, in large part because an Orangist-led government would be closer to the English monarchy, meaning that they could unite their power against him. Far better, then, to support the pro-French monarchy faction led by de Witt, and keep the English monarchy isolated. At this time, de Witt was the most prominent political figure in the Dutch government, Though he wasn't all-powerful, he did hold a lot of sway over Dutch government policy. His foreign policy was based on the idea that, going forward, neutrality was not a viable option, and so sought alliances which would safeguard the government's interests. In 1662, the Dutch government would sign an alliance with the French monarchy. While the French monarchy's support was politically useful, however, they weren't exactly a friend. This was an alliance of convenience that was intended to help Louis XIV increase his own continental power, and he had his eyes on the Spanish Netherlands. If, or when, he did try to take it, and would almost certainly succeed in doing so, this would bring the French monarchy right up to the borders of the United Provinces, and an expansionist monarchy at the door didn't sound very comforting. De Witt came up with an idea of creating a series of cantons from the Spanish Netherlands regions, to act as a security barrier in the event of a French monarchy invasion of the region, though I doubt he said that to Louis, and the French monarchy was very open to the idea. However, Dutch merchants in Amsterdam were not, concerned that any radical political change in the Spanish Netherlands could put their trade monopolies at risk, from which they greatly profited since the end of the Eighty Years' War. This is where we can start talking more about Colbert again. The finance minister ascribed to the dominant economic ideology of the day, mercantilism, which posited that wealth increased a government's power, but that there was a finite amount of wealth in the world, and so, to increase and safeguard the government's power, strong protectionist and militarily expansionist policies should be undertaken to accumulate as much wealth as possible. 
A central part of mercantilism is that exports should far outweigh imports in order to keep money flowing into the political centre rather than out of it. When the Eighty Years' War ended in 1648, all constraints on trade from the United Provinces were lifted, leading to huge financial and commercial growth. But, due to mercantilist policies, this came at the expense of other countries' merchants. Colbert, according to one historian, was determined not only to break free of Dutch trade primacy in so far as it held France in subjection, but also to overthrow Dutch trade hegemony generally and replace it with that of France. One of the French monarchy's main strengths in this regard was textiles, the market for which was extremely profitable in Spain and the Spanish monarchy's empire. As the historian explains, if France could capture effective control of the Spanish trade, and this was well within the bounds of immediate possibility, French merchants would secure the lion's share of the silver and dye stuffs of the Spanish Indies, and the bulk of Spain's wool exports. This, in turn, should enable France to capture the Ottoman market for fine cloth, and assume first place in the commerce of the Near East. France, in other words, was well placed not only to dislocate the Dutch world entrepôt, but also to capture Europe's rich trades. You might remember that the Dutch government was supposed to be an ally of the French monarchy at this time, but you'd be forgetting two things. First, mercantilism is about the accumulation of profit for power at the expense of other governments. Second, foreign policy is about the accumulation of power at the expense of other governments. As Bourbon himself once said, everyone arranges treaties according to his present interests. They were absolutely essential for foreign policy, but of little significance beyond their sound when present interests changed. Under mercantilist policies, economics was a form of warfare to increase government power. Always looking to increase his own power, Louis XIV was very open to the idea of a trade war. In 1664, Bourbon and Colbert established the French West India and French East India companies to increase French merchants' investments in profitable trading areas, and the French monarchy captured the Dutch government's colony of Cayenne, that same year, tariffs on Dutch trade came into effect, as well as attempts to undermine Dutch merchants' sugar plantations in the New World, which were worked by enslaved people, by establishing sugar refineries in France. In 1665, the Dutch government and English monarchy went to war, primarily about trade, and the French monarchy backed the Dutch government as their nominal ally, in line with their 1662 treaty. Though the Dutch government quite rightly saw the French monarchy as a prominent commercial rival, who planned to undermine their economy whenever they could. Although Louis did limit his trade war for the time being. As one historian wrote, Louis judged England to be the stronger of the two adversaries, at any rate in firepower, and he had no intention of helping his northern neighbour become mistress of world trade and navigation. Only with England's defeat in 1667 did he conclude that there was now no further need to curb Colbert's mercantilist programme. However, before getting ahead of ourselves, according to the 1662 treaty I mentioned earlier, the French monarchy was supposed to come to the aid of the Dutch government in a war. Louis, I've seen it argued, preferred to let the both sides fight each other into a mutually damaging stalemate, allowing the French monarchy to grow in power at their expense. He'd only start to get involved, though not to a huge extent, when things began looking a bit too grim for the Dutch government. After all, he was getting ready for his own war, and preparing for it under the guise of intervening in the Second Anglo-Dutch War was a useful cover. Since the end of the Thirty Years' War, Eighty Years' War, and Franco-Spanish War, the Spanish monarchy's power had remained weaker than what it once was, and had to contend with the growing power of the English and French monarchies and the Dutch government. There was infighting in the Spanish monarchy's court, financial troubles abounded, climate change was affecting crop growth, and then the king died in late 1665. The new and seemingly perpetually unwell king, Charles II, was just a toddler, so his mum was actually in charge. The unstable position of the Spanish monarchy provided Louis XIV with the opportunity to increase his own power and sense of glory. To the Austrian Habsburg branch, it was obvious that the French monarchy would soon move against the Spanish monarchy. The Austrian emperor, Leopold I, was faced with a choice. Should he accept that the French monarchy's rising hegemony was inevitable, and work with it, working out a deal whereby he could ensure the continued Habsburg control of as much of the Spanish branch's European empire as possible, 
Or should he double down, and, despite the Spanish monarchy's weakness, present a united Habsburg front to the growing Bourbon threat? It should also be kept in mind that there was the added dimension to this decision of yet another war of the Ottoman Sultanate breaking out in future, the last one having only just finished, and, if Leopold chose to stand against Louis Bourbon, then the Ottoman Sultan might take the opportunity to move against him in the east. Louis, meanwhile, was laying the legal and political groundwork for his invasion of the Spanish Netherlands. Politically, he turned towards the Portuguese monarchy. For over two decades, by 1666, the Spanish monarchy had been tied down fighting a war in Portugal. Much as the Second Anglo-Dutch War was useful to Bourbon in that it kept his opponents weakening each other to his advantage, so too was the war in Portugal to his advantage, in that it was keeping an already weakened Spanish monarchy even weaker, and less able to counter the growing power of the French monarchy. So, Louis signed a military assistance treaty with the Portuguese monarchy in March 1667. In return for the Portuguese monarchy continuing their war with the Spanish monarchy, and thus tying down their resources, Louis promised to support their war effort, and declare war on the Spanish monarchy too, within 30 months. With the assurance that pressure would remain placed on the Spanish monarchy, Louis unveiled his legal justification for invading the Spanish Netherlands in a hundreds of pages long pamphlet. You might remember earlier how, as part of the Treaty of the Pyrenees ending the Franco-Spanish War in 1659, Louis was married to Maria Theresa, who had to give up her hereditary territorial claims in exchange for an extremely large payment instead. As such, when her father died in 1665 and her half-brother became the new king, Maria Theresa was not legally liable to any territorial inheritance. However, because of the poor state of the Spanish economy, that large payment promised in the 1659 treaty was never actually paid. This would provide Bourbon with the excuse. His argument was that, legally speaking, the fact that his wife had never been given the money she was promised meant that her relinquishment of her territorial inheritance was no longer valid. Additionally, in parts of the Spanish Netherlands at this time, there was a legal principle which said that the female children from a first marriage had precedence over male children from a second marriage when it came to claiming inheritance. The current Spanish king, Charles II, was the half-brother of Maria Theresa, meaning that, by this principle, she had precedence to her father's land over him. This principle was known as devolution. And Louis argued that, on account of local law and the failure to get the promised big bags of money, the Spanish Netherlands should devolve to his wife. In practice, of course, this meant devolving to him. Louis would order the invasion in May 1667. From Bourbon's perspective, he couldn't have had a better chance to invade than when he did. The English monarchy and Dutch governments were too tied down destroying each other to have any chance of opposing him, while, to the south, the Spanish monarchy was still tied down fighting the Portuguese monarchy, Louis's new ally. The situation in the east was also in his favour. You may remember me saying that the Austrian monarchy was debating which position to take in the pre-war period. Once French armies began marching through the mostly undefended Spanish Netherlands, they had to come to a quick decision. Some of Leopold I's most senior advisers were in favour of him taking a strong stand against Bourbon. We can call them the War Party. As far as they were concerned, the Spanish monarchy falling into Bourbon hands was a national security risk to the Austrian monarchy's own territories, and set a dangerous precedent that would see Louis turn his military towards Germany, seeking to make himself the most powerful monarch in Western Europe. As one of the war party exclaimed, the 30,000 horses which the French army has are not designed for Holland, but for a country as wide and open as Germany, which is his second goal. In fact, one prominent French lawyer actually declared that Louis's justification for the war of devolution was so compelling that, in addition to the Spanish Netherlands, large parts of Germany should also come under his authority. The only path forward in the eyes of the war party to protect Habsburg interests was to defeat Bourbon sooner rather than have to face him later, when his conquests might have made him militarily stronger. However, there was also another faction in the court. We can call them the Peace Party. In their view, the Austrian monarchy was simply in no position to counter Louis militarily. The most recent war of the Ottoman Sultan had only just ended, and there was always the likelihood of another conflict in the near future. 
Additionally, they argued, the policy of always standing by the Spanish branch of the Habsburg family was out of date. Their regional power had been declining for decades, and the French monarchy was supplanting their hegemonic position. It would be far more prudent to accept this new reality and think not what was in the best interests of the Habsburg family as a whole, but in the interests solely of the Austrian branch. In other words, abandon Charles II and join Louis XIV, to ensure that the Austrian monarchy remained a major continental power, and not tied to a declining one. Besides, an alliance with Bourbon would securely uphold Western borders, and allow him to focus more on what they saw as the bigger threat, the Ottoman Sultan, not to mention rebellions in Hungary. Leopold was convinced by the peace party's arguments, and so decided that he would remain neutral in the War of Devolution, provided that the French monarchy gave him compensation for doing so. To jump ahead in time a bit, in January 1668, the Austrian monarchy moved away from centuries of Habsburg unity, and signed secret partition treaties of the Spanish monarchy's lands with the French monarchy. Anyway, back to 1667. Multiple towns in the Spanish Netherlands were besieged and fell to French forces in the spring and early summer. To the Dutch government still fighting the English monarchy, Louis suddenly became their primary threat. While the Dutch government was by no means a friend of the Spanish monarchy, being so plagued by so many troubles, they didn't pose much threat to their interests. However, a militaristic and actively expansionist French monarchy almost certainly did. It was true that the Dutch government was in fact allied with Louis. However, it was also true that he'd launched a trade war against them, stolen their colony of Cayenne, and had barely helped them in the Second Anglo-Dutch War, except to keep the war as a stalemate while he got more powerful at their expense. He was an ally of convenience, and now he was a threat. Time to look at the Swedish monarchy, which, despite me not actually having mentioned it yet, is also a central figure in the War of Devolution. For decades, the Swedish monarchy had been the ever-growing hegemonic power in the Baltic, and it controlled nearly every port in the Baltic Sea, and as such, the Baltic Sea trade routes. The people of the United Provinces were heavily reliant on Baltic wheat, and so the Swedish monarchy's monopolistic hold over the wheat trade was a concern for the Dutch government. To counterbalance the Swedish monarchy growing too strong, the Dutch government supported the Danish monarchy, and the Swedish monarchy, for its part, was supportive of the English and French monarchies, the Dutch government's commercial rivals. In 1656, the Swedish monarchy, looking to take the final major port outside of its control in the Baltic, besieged the port city of Danzig, which, due to its importance to Dutch trade, led the Dutch government to respond by sending ships and soldiers in support of the Danzig garrison forcing the Swedish monarchy to sign an agreement which protected Dutch government economic interests. Several years later, in 1658, the Dutch government again intervened in a Baltic war against the Swedish monarchy, this time in support of the Danish monarchy. The French monarchy and the English government also got involved, diplomatically at least, pushing the Danish and Swedish monarchies to make peace, which they did in 1660. For Mazarin, it was because he wanted the Swedish monarchy as an ally against the Austrian Habsburg branch. For the newly enthroned Charles II, it was because peace in the Baltic was better for trade. When the Second Anglo-Dutch War broke out in 1665, supporting the English monarchy was the obvious choice for the Swedish monarchy. Though, because of a, let's call it donation, from Louis XIV, they stayed neutral. There were, though, it seems, those who felt that a policy change was needed. Hostile relations with the Dutch government had not exactly been to the Swedish monarchy's benefit over the years, whereas an alliance with them would allow them to pursue their own interests more effectively. After all, if the Dutch government weren't allied with the Danish monarchy, that basically gave the Swedish monarchy a blank check against their regional rival. Additionally, after years of war, the Swedish monarchy was kind of broke, while the Dutch government had lots of money, some of which, with an alliance, could go into the Swedish economy. The Swedish monarchy's plan, then, was to get closer to the Dutch government, and one way to do that was to act as a mediator between them and the English monarchy to end the Second Anglo-Dutch War. This would actually begin in early 1667, before the start of the War of Devolution in May, but because negotiations were so drawn out, and because of the political developments during them, they would last until months after Louis's war began. So we'll jump back in time a bit to look more at this. The English monarchy would try as hard as they could to use the peace process to increase their power by playing upon the factional split in the Dutch government 
between the more pro-English monarchy Orangists and the Republicans. In February 1667, Charles II, through Swedish monarchy intermediaries, proposed The Hague, a pro-Orangist city, as the site for the negotiations. When Louis XIV heard about this, he was suspicious. At this time, he was laying the groundwork for invading the Spanish Netherlands, and so wasn't necessarily in favour of an end to the Second Anglo-Dutch War. Nor was he in favour of the English monarchy gaining any post-war influence in the United Provinces, through their Orangist allies going easy on them in the peace process. He, after all, supported Johann de Witt's Republican faction, and so, if they conducted most of the negotiations rather than the Orangists, this also opened up the possibility for Bourbon to extend his own influence into post-war Dutch government politics. For de Witt's faction, the English monarchy appeared to be attempting to give legitimacy to the Orangist faction, and encourage a return of the House of Orange to the stewardship. According to one historian, Charles certainly was trying to undermine de Witt, who he saw as the principal driving force behind an anti-English monarchy policy. Knowing that something was up, de Witt didn't want peace negotiations to take place in a pro-Orangist city. One thing to know about the United Provinces is that it was exactly that, a group of provinces with their own regional governments, all united under and participating in one bigger government, called the States General. While de Witt was the most prominent man in the States General, he wasn't all-powerful, and had to contend with the conflicting interests of the regional governments. Some regional governments, unlike de Witt, supported peace negotiations taking place in The Hague, and it took some time for de Witt to get just enough regional governments on side to block Charles's proposal. Louis Bourbon inserted himself into the dispute, trying to keep Dutch politics as much under his control as possible. In mid-February, he suggested to the Dutch government that the peace negotiations take place in Dover, in England, because, as one historian explained, he believed a flat rejection of The Hague might scandalise Christendom and provide evil-minded people with a pretext to stir up trouble. By this, he was taking a jab at Dutch democracy, which he saw as a weak system liable to be led astray, apparently unlike a monarchy. Also, if the negotiations were held in the Kingdom of England, then there was little chance of the English monarchy being able to take advantage of the Orangist Republican factionalism, which was in Louis's interests. He imperialistically claimed in a letter to the Dutch government that he was intervening in their peace negotiations for their own good, like a father who always kept in mind what benefited his children. Louis's suggestion caused more internal divisions in the Dutch government. Some were happy with the suggestion. Some were insulted to be called the children of a French king who suggested negotiating in the lands of a monarchy they'd just defeated. Another thing to know that I've not really mentioned is that Louis, preparing for the War of Devolution, was suspicious of the influence of the Spanish monarchy behind English monarchy machinations. Okay, we're going to have to jump back in time again, but only quickly. Back in the 1650s, when England was a republic, many exiled monarchists gathered in France, where the monarchy took up support for the Stuart family's claim to the throne. Having a potential leader of another country in your back pocket is always useful, after all. However, when Cardinal Mazarin wanted to make an alliance with the Republican English government at the height of the Franco-Spanish War, that meant they basically had to kick the English government's monarchist opponents to the curb, and they turned to the Spanish monarchy as their new benefactor. While not exactly allies, they were at the time fighting one another in Portugal, the regression to monarchism in 1660 did mean that there was the potential for Spanish monarchy influence to be behind English monarchy, and perhaps even their Dutch Orangist allies' actions, in trying to gain more of their own influence from the 1667 peace negotiations. While I don't know for certain if there was, Louis didn't want that to happen at a time when he was counting on keeping all of his opponents as weak and divided as possible, so that he'd have free reign to march into the Spanish Netherlands without too much opposition. Anyway, I don't want to get too deeply into everything here, but long story short, the Dutch government was extremely split over the issue of where to hold the negotiations, and regional governments began falling out with one another, accusing one another of all sorts of things. Then the Swedish monarchy, which, as we've seen, had its own interests in getting a quick peace treaty to the Second Anglo-Dutch War, which, just so we all remember, was actually still ongoing at this point, also started criticising the Dutch government's refusal to just pick a place and start negotiating. Louis XIV, needing a stable Republican-run Dutch government, was also growing impatient with its infighting, 
Many of them, meanwhile, were growing impatient with Louis' involvement. He'd not only barely helped them in their war and launched a trade war against them, but was now trying to dictate how they should conduct their peace talks, and trying to get them to do it where he wanted. As one historian argued, many Dutch politicians believed he was purposefully increasing divisions to create more time for himself to launch a war in the Spanish Netherlands. Eventually, the whole conflict over locations was solved when Charles II accepted the city of Breda to conduct peace talks. Then, in May, the War of Devolution was launched. The Spanish monarchy simply just wasn't in a position to really do all that much at the start of the War of Devolution. They were too politically, economically and militarily hampered by internal problems and the Portuguese War to support their troops in the Spanish Netherlands many of whom were under siege in the spring and summer of 1667. In other words, there was very little standing in the way of Louis XIV taking as much territory as he wanted, more or less, as quickly as militarily possible. There were about 20,000 Spanish troops in the Spanish Netherlands to defend 50 fortified areas, against perhaps as many as 72,000 French soldiers. In other words, the army was very thinly stretched. The regional Spanish commander had been asking the monarchy for more troops since 1666, to no avail, and exclaimed that, should the French monarchy attack, nothing short of a miracle can save these provinces. When the French monarchy did in fact attack, there was so little resistance that the war became known as strolling in a military fashion. The French commander was so desperate to avoid being totally overrun that, with war looming in early May 1667, he wrote to Louis asking for terms. He was ignored. He also couldn't expect help from the Austrian Habsburgs, because, as we've seen, they decided to abandon their Spanish cousins and ally with Louis. Additionally, the French monarchy had taken extra steps to ensure that they couldn't come to the defence of the Spanish Netherlands even if they wanted to. From July 1666 to May 1667, Louis renewed the Treaty for the League of the Rhine, first established by Cardinal Mazarin in 1658, in large part through bribing the various electors and bishops involved whose lands would act as a buffer zone between the Austrian monarchy and the Spanish Netherlands, blocking any line of military advance. With everything in place, the French army had invaded and quickly began besieging and capturing towns. Things went so well that Louis proclaimed, Who knows what destiny I may hold for all Europe? Needless to say, the situation worried the Dutch government. As we've seen, Louis was their ally, but it's foreign policy, so it was only insofar as he got something out of it too. One day, he might decide the alliance was no longer useful, and, rather, a constraint on his ability to get more land, power and glory. The situation also worried the English monarchy, who didn't want to see the French monarchy becoming too continentally hegemonic. Despite having been at war since 1665, by 1667, they now both had a mutual interest in opposing Bourbon's expansionism. Then, in June, a Dutch government fleet bombarded the English town of Sheerness, sailed up the river Medway to the naval base of Chatham, pretty much wiped out the English navy, and then stole Charles II's flagship. This was such a crippling defeat that the English monarchy had little choice but to quickly agree to end the war in July. As autumn and winter 1667 set in, military operations mostly ground to a halt. By now, Louis had control over numerous major towns and cities in the Spanish Netherlands and, before the next campaigning season began in spring, demanded that the Spanish monarchy accept that he was now in charge of the region, and, thus, peace. This was very unlikely to happen for two reasons. One of these was that the Spanish monarchy rejected Louis' claim to the Spanish Netherlands, and published a pamphlet breaking down and debunking the legal arguments of devolution used to justify the invasion, arguing that, while the law did exist, it couldn't apply to political matters, and that there was no legal precedent for it. They might not have had the military might to successfully oppose Louis in 1667, but they were going to try their best to gain the moral and legal high ground. The second reason they were very unlikely to accept an unfavourable peace was recent developments in the Portuguese War. King Alfonso VI was unofficially deposed by his brother Pedro. Alfonso remained king, but Pedro had the power. Pedro wanted to end the war, and a Spanish monarchy, who was losing the war, agreed. On Pedro's part, this was kind of in violation of the 1667 Treaty of Lisbon negotiated by Louis XIV to keep the war going, 
and it would free up large numbers of Spanish troops to counter Louis' expansionism to the north. De Witt, for his part, was trying to encourage the Spanish government, including with money, to agree to end the war as quickly as possible by accepting Louis' peace demands, a ceasefire in return for the French monarchy, only keeping those territories which it had captured by the end of the summer. Louis did, however, also offer to renounce his wife's devolution claims in return for other territories, such as the entire Duchy of Luxembourg and the Franche-Comté. De Witt saw these demands as too, well, demanding, and advised the French monarchy to be a bit more moderate. Needless to say, this didn't go down well with Louis Bourbon. His Majesty is furious, de Witt was informed, that he sought to prevent him from profiting by the renewal of the war if Spain should decline peace. Louis demanded that if the Spanish monarchy refused to accept his peace offers, then they, the Dutch government, should also enter the war. At this time, the Spanish ambassador in the United Provinces offered to give up a fortress to Louis XIV in return for lots of money and Dutch soldiers. This didn't happen. Louis still saw the Dutch government as a useful ally, and there had, if you remember, been the idea floating around some time ago, although there was commercial opposition, of making some parts of the Spanish Netherlands along the border of the United Provinces into cantons. Well, there was very little enthusiasm in the Dutch government for agreeing to join Louis's war, even despite the fact that Louis promised not to advance too far into the region if they did. Though, on their own, there was little they could do to stop him. In the event, the Spanish monarchy rejected peace, and the Dutch government did actually pass some resolutions in support of the French monarchy in January 1668. However, one of them stated that the English and Swedish monarchies should also be brought in to put pressure on the Spanish monarchy to accept the peace terms, and that, if they did, then the French monarchy would be constrained by those terms. In other words, they wanted to ensure that Louis wouldn't be able to further expand his kingdom in future. But wait a minute, why were the Dutch government suddenly asking the English and Swedish monarchies to be included? Well, there'd been some developments. As I said, the Swedish monarchy had a vested interest in peace between the English monarchy and Dutch government, while they in turn had a vested interest both in good relations with the Swedish monarchy for trade purposes and in containing Bourbon expansionism. An alliance between them all could help accomplish all of these goals. It wasn't suddenly one big happy friendship, though. With the signing of the Treaty of Breda in July 1667, Dutch government diplomats went to London to discuss how to bring a swift end to the War of Devolution and, in the winter, English monarchy diplomats visited The Hague to discuss proposals with de Witt to unite against Bourbon imperialism. On New Year's Day 1668, Charles II sent another team to The Hague to try to establish an alliance. De Witt, however, wasn't fully committed to the idea of a formal alliance, or so I've seen one historian argue. According to this thesis, de Witt hoped that the mere possibility that the Dutch could make an alliance with England would persuade Louis XIV to lessen and limit his demands in the Spanish Netherlands. During October and November 1667, de Witt had thought that Louis XIV was indeed showing greater restraint. In January 1668, de Witt was still confident of French agreement. He hoped that French moderation would help him to escape the pressure from his adversaries in the States General for outright collaboration with England. In light of this, de Witt wanted to pressure the Spanish monarchy to accept Louis' peace demands, and he didn't trust the English monarchy not to be trying to carry out some underhanded scheme. In all honesty, he was actually kind of right. Despite negotiating for an alliance with the Dutch government, Charles II's so-called cabal ministry approached the French monarchy's ambassador and proposed a military alliance between their two monarchies against the Dutch government, though Louis XIV rejected the idea, still seeing the Dutch government as a useful ally. Although de Witt didn't trust the English monarchy, it wasn't necessarily up to him whether or not an alliance was made with them. He was essentially the figurehead of the United Provinces, but he wasn't all-powerful. And, if the government elected to make an alliance, then he had no real power to stop them. That's exactly what they decided to do, and in January 1668, he found himself having to sign a treaty with the English monarchy. In April, the Swedish monarchy would sign it too, creating what is known as the Triple Alliance. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to keep on calling it the Triple Alliance, but remember that until April 1668, this was actually just an alliance between the English monarchy and the Dutch government. 
The French monarchy, knowing that some sort of treaty was being decided upon, were shocked by the speed with which it was signed. They'd assumed that, firstly, it would take a long time to go through the regional and city governments to be debated and agreed upon, and, secondly, that their ally de Vite would do more to delay it. Instead, he couldn't, and the States General alone simply decided on the treaty, something that didn't really follow the constitution, but the English monarchy pushed for. The main French monarchy agent in the United Provinces was also caught further off guard by all of this, when the decided upon conditions of the treaty were given to the regional governments to vote in favour of. As one historian explained, he'd been bribing figures in the regional governments in anticipation of this moment, but once the alliance had been approved by the states general at the top, it turned out that the provincial municipal bodies too cast their votes in favour. In view of the tremendous outpouring of popular enthusiasm, no one dared earn the money of France. In January 1668, the Austrian monarch completed his new policy shift, away from supporting his Spanish cousins and allied with Louis XIV instead. That month, both monarchs signed a secret treaty to partition the Spanish monarchy's empire. In the United Provinces, de Witt was in a tricky situation, now that the double, and soon to be triple, alliance had been established. He, after all, wasn't really in favour of it in practice, preferring that merely the threat of it would act as a deterrent to the French king. Also, he would have preferred to keep the French monarchy as an ally, which, for all intents and purposes, was going to be pretty difficult when his government decided that Louis was such a threat that they needed to ally against him with two monarchies that they'd been at war with multiple times in the past decade. Regardless, he'd do what he could to maintain good relations, and do what he could to try to limit the French monarchy's conquests in the Spanish Netherlands. The first step he took towards this was by writing to the French monarchy to tell them that the alliance with the English monarchy was only intended to put pressure on the Spanish monarchy to agree to peace, in line with the resolutions the Dutch government had signed in early January. According to one historian I read, de Witt, despite the situation he was in, was still confident that he could steer things to his advantage. De Witt saw the preservation of peace by a deft manipulation of the complex diplomatic situation. He envisaged hostility to France only in the improbable event that, if Spain accepted Louis' demands, the French monarchy would still not make peace. De Witt was also in a tricky situation in that he was the leading political figure in the Dutch government, and while he didn't necessarily want the Triple Alliance as an established fact, the responsibility for it in Bourbon's eyes would fall on him. Besides, he could hardly try to defend himself by telling the French monarchy that he wanted to use the threat of the alliance as a form of blackmail against them because he didn't actually consider their expansion, which his own government had basically passed a resolution condoning by demanding that the Spanish monarchy accept peace terms to be in his government's best interests. De Witt wanted to keep the French monarchy on his side, though, because he felt that they would be a useful ally in future. To him, they were much more dependably on his side than the English monarchy, who he feared would be, in future, as he put it, led once more into evil principles. Louis, in fact, had tried to drive a wedge between the Dutch government and English monarchy in the months leading up to the Triple Alliance by trying to bribe Charles II. But there was fear in the English government that Bourbon was trying to establish a universal monarchy across Europe, and so balancing against him was the more popular policy. On the surface, the actual conditions of the treaty which brought the Triple Alliance into being were actually fairly moderate towards Bourbon. They wanted to politically rather than militarily counter his expansionism after all. There was a clause about mutual defence, that the monarchies and governments would work separately or in concert with the French monarchy to pressure the Spanish monarchy to accept Louis' peace demands, to try to get a ceasefire until May 1668, and compel Bourbon to agree not to conquer any more of the Spanish Netherlands. That was the public treaty, anyway. There were also secret clauses, one of which being that if either the French monarchy or Spanish monarchy refused to abide by the peace conditions, the Triple Alliance would go to war with them. If it were Louis that refused, then the monarchies and government of the Triple Alliance planned on pushing his forces back to the borders of 1659. So, on the surface, the goals of the Triple Alliance seemed to be quite favourable to Louis XIV. In return for promising not to invade anymore, they'd pressure the Spanish monarchy to accept peace. 
and he'd get to keep some of the lands he claimed to own. When it was unveiled in January 1668, Louis's ministers wrote favourably about the alliance to their agents in the United Provinces, happy to see that their ally was going to put pressure on the Spanish monarchy, just as Louis had wanted. Happy, that is, until they found out about the secret clause. Louis was most angry with de Vite, whom he, honestly quite wrongly, saw as the architect of all of this. Who do they think they are, he would exclaim of the Dutch government, treating their greatest benefactor in such a manner? The Dutch government had been his ally for years. True, Louis had been a pretty terrible ally, but they were supposed to serve his interests. Now they were planning to go to war with him to constrain his drive for power and glory. As far as he was concerned, this was betrayal, and, in his words, treason. In the United Provinces, de Witt, who in fairness had more wanted to have the threat of the Triple Alliance as a deterrent against Louis, rather than an actual physical military threat, would try to defend himself against the monarchy's anger. He claimed that, because Louis was happy with the territories he'd receive when the War of Devolution came to an end, the secret clause didn't really matter anyway. Besides, he argued, it was only a secret clause not because he was trying to hide it, but because he didn't agree with the English monarchy's arguments to make it public, on account of the fact that these terms might be interpreted by the public in ways which could alter the existing good understanding between the king and the states. In February 1668, the Dutch ambassador in France had a very awkward interview about the Triple Alliance with the French foreign minister. As one historian relates the meeting, the Dutch ambassador consented to read briefly the first two of the secret articles, but refused to read the third, providing for possible war against France. The French foreign minister informed him that the French already knew its provisions, and gave him a stern warning of its probable effect upon the ruler of France. Meanwhile, in the United Provinces, de Witt was informed by the French ambassador that they had been given the text of the secret articles by the English monarchy. Naturally, de Witt was pretty horrified at his new allies giving away the contents of the secret treaties, which he desperately wanted kept secret so as to maintain the alliance with the Bourbon family. I have seen one historian argue that the English monarchy told the French monarchy about the article threatening war because they did not anticipate the moderate attitude taken at first towards the Triple Alliance at the French court, and found it necessary to divulge the secret articles in order to disturb this French equanimity so inimical to his purposes in the Triple Alliance. Not to mention the fact that it also undermined de Witt, who stood in opposition to Charles's nephew, William of Orange, becoming steward. As far as Louis XIV was concerned, the Triple Alliance Treaty was a thinly veiled personal attack, made against myself alone, as much because it was decided upon amongst my foes, as because in the state of affairs at that time it appeared that peace would depend only upon me. The treaty did say, after all, that if he tried to take more land than the Triple Alliance agreed with, then there'd be war. To the French monarchy, the 1662 alliance between the Dutch government and themselves had effectively been annulled by the treaty. In early February 1668, after months of preparations, Louis expanded the War of Devolution by invading the Franche-Comté, facing minimal resistance. I have seen two reasons suggested for why he did this in light of the secret clause. The first is that it could be used as a bargaining chip in negotiations with the Spanish monarchy, yet he'd be willing to keep or give up depending on their decision. Remember how his peace demand was that either he got to keep everything he'd already taken in the Spanish Netherlands, or he'd give that up in return for Luxembourg and the Franche-Comté. The second reason was in defiance of the Triple Alliance. Louis claimed that he waged his war to protect the Dutch government, which, let's be honest, wasn't true, nor even the justification given in 1667, and was so outraged by the secret clause that he even discussed invading the United Provinces with his generals once he had finished taking the Franche-Comté. His generals were in favour, and saw the Dutch government as an easy target. If the French monarchy invaded, they declared, it would be a walkover. Remember, this was February, and it wouldn't be until April that the Swedish monarchy would join the alliance, making it an actual triple alliance, so they weren't really a threat at this point. The French monarchy didn't see the English monarchy as in any real position to go to war against them right now, and were confident that they could count on the League of the Rhine and Leopold I of Austria to either support them or stay neutral too. <laughs> 
The only thing that stopped a massive expansion of the War of Devolution was the French finance minister, Colbert, and the foreign minister, Lyon. Colbert's argument was that it was financially impossible to go to war at this time. The economy simply wouldn't be able to afford the cost. He argued for a continuation of the trade war policies, especially the tariffs, against the Dutch government, which had been in place for the past few years. Since the 1667 tariffs, Dutch trade with French merchants had already fallen by over 30%, with some items being taxed at 100% of their value. Increasing the trade war would also hurt the English economy too, he argued. Colbert would, over the next few years, essentially be given free reign to employ any policies he wanted to hurt the Dutch economy. Lyon, the foreign minister, argued that there was no necessity for war because the Dutch have formed a league that will force Spain to do our bidding. We do not have to spend a penny. Rather than expand the war, he believed Louis could get the best deal in light of the Triple Alliance by agreeing to end the War of Devolution and negotiating for control of the territories he wanted. Louis agreed with his two ministers. He would not invade the United Provinces. Not yet, at least. By the start of May 1668, the Swedish monarchy had joined the Triple Alliance. The War of Devolution had been going on for a year, and the Spanish monarchy went on the offensive in Catalonia. Granted, it was a very small offensive that was quite easily beaten back, but still. At this time, de Witt was trying what we could call damage control when it came to relations with the French monarchy, pushing a plan whereby the Dutch government would support Louis' territorial ambitions to all Spanish monarchy territories when Charles II, who was an extremely sick child, died. All, that is, except the Spanish Netherlands, which would be reorganised into that cantonment idea I talked about earlier on in the video. When it was first proposed, Louis was in favour of cantons, and Dutch merchants were opposed. I'd be pretty confident in saying that now Louis was just as much opposed as the merchants, seeing as how his response was that he'd only agree to this if the Triple Alliance were dissolved. The War of Devolution came to an end that May, with the signing of the Treaty of Aix la chapelle which allowed Louis to keep most of his conquests, except for a few in the Spanish Netherlands and the Franche-Comté. It has been argued ever since, and I think with good reason, that the creation of the Triple Alliance was the single biggest factor in ending the war, even if it did almost make Louis expand it further. The French monarchy would try to claim that the Triple Alliance had nothing to do with it, and it was all just Louis' honour and just moderation. The French monarchy threw a celebratory event in Paris, with fireworks, music, a few cannon blasts, and a water fountain filled with wine. However, I personally don't know if I'd call the war a victory for Bourbon. True, he'd won all the sieges, but winning wars is more about political victories rather than military victories, which aren't always the same things. Consider the situation prior to and following the War of Devolution. Before the war, the French monarchy's enemies to the north were so divided that they were fighting one another, while its enemy to the south was tied down fighting a long war in Portugal, and their League of the Rhine allies guarded their western flank. Louis had embarked upon this war in large part for his own personal power and sense of glory, seeking to take advantage of his neighbouring monarchy's weakness. However, following the war, the Spanish monarchy was no longer at war in Portugal, and could focus on fixing its damaged economy, which could make it more of a threat in the long run. The French monarchy's northern enemies had joined forces to oppose them, and threatened war if Louis didn't rein in his foreign policy. His own economy was in need of some work, and the League of the Rhine, though it had been bribed to last for another decade, actually ceased to be in the aftermath of the War of Devolution. True, it wasn't too much of an issue because the Austrian monarchy was a new ally, but recent events had shown the French king that his own allies couldn't necessarily be trusted. As per the peace treaty, Louis had captured some territories, but had to give up some others. The strategic situation, if not a political defeat, was unfavourable, to say the least. Just eight years ago, in large part due to Cardinal Mazarin, the French monarchy was, for the first time in a very long time, no longer surrounded by enemies. Now, in 1668, because of Louis's war, that was no longer true to the north and south, and who knows about the west. It was going to require a lot of work to fix, but Louis was also out for revenge. By summer 1668, David had decided that there was little more point in trying to keep Bourbon happy, 
He was obviously angry, feeling betrayed, and stepping up his economic war against the Dutch government. The Dutch government's future security in this new strategic situation rested upon the Triple Alliance, and de Witt, despite all of the issues he'd had with it, became more convinced of the need to strengthen it, and told an English diplomat that, if war with Louis should come, an outcome he described as, that point where we do not wish to come except in the event of inescapable necessity, the Dutch government would be prepared. Louis would also be prepared. His ego had been damaged, and his enemies had allied in order to block his path to greater glory. He was angriest of all at his former ally, the Dutch government, and de Witt in particular, upon whom he laid the most blame. The king's chief engineer, Vauban, advised him that there is no judge more equitable than cannons, and soon enough French artillery began having the final argument of kings inscribed onto them. According to an English diplomat, one French minister would inform de Witt and the English monarchy that if they fought to prescribe Louis laws and force him to compliance, by leagues between themselves or with Spain, though Sweden and the German princes should join with them, he knew his master would not flinch, and that it would come to a war of forty years. Louis was going to start preparing for a war of revenge against the Dutch government, and it was a war in which de Witt, the object of Louis's rage, would be ripped apart, and allegedly partially cannibalised. <laughs> 